maybe not paying attention uh, to the story as much as we should. Uh, I added in injections because I think uh, that's a very important part of our physical examination as well as sorting out uh, painful joints. Uh, so I'm very liberal with injections and reevaluating patients with either subacromial, AC, biceps injections. So the elements of physical exam, this is eighth grade health to all of you. I think we all know what we're looking for, but I think sometimes we breeze through maybe some of the important and differentiating features of each parts of the physical exam. So maybe I'll try to highlight some of the things that I see as important in our, um, I think, uh, decision-making uh, elements of the physical exam. So inspection, uh, there's a few things that I think you get sort of that blink. You see a patient and immediately you see something on, on inspection that should trigger uh, what's going on with this patient. So uh, if our, our fellow here is a long head of biceps rupture, we're thinking uh, anterior superior cuff tear, that it's not going to be an isolated biceps rupture, old scars, uh, how does the deltoid functioning after previous open surgery. Uh, AC joint, is it uh, reduced, is it not, is it arthritic, is it prominent? Scapular, we talked about scapular yesterday, is, is there scata, uh, static scapular winging when we look on inspection? Uh, all of these things you should be able to see in, in a few milliseconds. And <clears throat> I think one of the things on inspection that I think is most important as a differentiator and probably fits in with this patient that was just presented by Mike is wasting. So. Uh, definitely got to examine people with their shirt off. We got to look for that wasting. Infraspinatus wasting is definitely a predictor of large tears, often irreparable tears, fatty infiltration, chronicity, and often irreparability. So wasting, I think, is a really important sign and is a predictor, I think, of outcome and re-tears when, um, when we do arthroscopic repairs. Palpation, I think we all palpate. Don't forget the neck. There's a huge crossover, as you know, between cervical spine disease and shoulder disease. I, I thought I had a cuff tear a couple of years ago, and as it progressed, I ended up with hand pain, num numbness and tingling and whatnot, and ended up being a cervical disc, which I had fixed, and all my shoulder pain went away miraculously. So don't forget about the neck, uh, periscapular tenors, AC joint, greater tuberosity, biceps, and uh, the sternoclavicular joint. Now, as we palpate, I usually palpate also as we put a patient through a range of motions. So don't forget about crepitus. One of Rich Hawkins' wisdoms was uh, you can have crepitus without a cuff tear, uh, but you can't have a cuff tear without crepitus. So I think crepitus is important to feel for, and so it's really important negative. If you have no crepitus in the subacromial space, chance of you having a significant cuff tear, I think, is much lower. Range of motion, obviously we look at active passive, and this, com this concept of pseudoparalysis, I think we define it generally as inability to lift our arm 90 degrees. And I, I don't know that that's a great definition, to be honest, because this guy here is clearly showing pseudoparalysis. He's really having to lock his, his glenohumeral joint to even move his scapula and attempt to lift his arm. This is true pseudoparalysis versus someone who basically has pain inhibition to lift his arm to 90 degrees. That's not pseudoparalysis. And I think the prognosis is completely different. So you want to look at the quality of the range of motion that they have. So this guy here, uh, he presents uh, with pain. He doesn't want to just lift his arm. He's grimacing here a little bit. And is that true pseudoparalysis, what he's showing us? Now, his passive range, or his active assisted range, is certainly OK. And then I usually go on to see, how does he do if he gets wall assistance? Uh, if we give him the assistance of the wall, can he work his way up? And you can do the same thing, just putting him supine. Can he go through an active range supine? Uh, that matters to me. And I think if they can, then I think a, a rehab program might help him quite a bit with a large cuff tear. So, I usually put them on uh, Ofer Levy's deltoid retraining program. That's a good reference for you to have, which is a, a published paper showing those with large massive tears and pseudoparalysis can regain their motion back with an appropriate rehab program. Now this guy here presented just a week or so ago. So he's actually got preserved active elevation, but you can just see the mechanics of his motion are a bit awkward. And this is right side that's affected. He's the guy that had the wasting. You can just see the quality of how he lifts his arm. He uses a lot more scapulothoracic motion to get his arm up overhead. He's trying to show me that he cross-country skis, and this is what he wants to be able to do. Um, so even though this guy has a large tear, he has a balanced tear. So you must have enough cuff front and back. And we'll see later in the, in the exam that's probably true. He has a leg sign. So we take him out in passive extra rotation. He can't maintain it. He's certainly weak. And so this guy's going to have a big tear. He's going to be a challenging patient. He's young, he's active, and he's going to have a big tear. 
So strength assessment, one of the comments that Rich Hawkins is always make is our, our assessment tools are inadequate. Our grading scale is not adequate. For orthopedics, we use two or three points of a, ten, of a five point grading scale. We need a different scale. We need something to be able to grade zero to 10, not three, three plus, four minus, four plus. So our, I think our scales is not adequate. Um, our empty can test for strength assessment has been assessed uh, scientifically. We, we published on this uh, a couple years ago. 72% sensitive for cuff tears, 64% specific. Uh, infra and teres minor, we look at extra rotation in more abductive position to look at lower parts of the cuff. And subscapularis, we'll go through a little bit here as well. So we're looking at his passive extra rotation, his leg sign. If he had excessive extra rotation, we might be thinking about subscapularis, but he's just weak and he can't maintain it out there. So this is a bad prognosis sign. This is a tear beyond 2.5, and we know from uh, good literature that tears beyond two centimeters have a much poor prognosis. His belly press is, is quite good. I sometimes put my hand between the belly and the, or his hand and the belly just to quantify that a little bit as to how hard he can push. We're looking at wrist flexion angle to see if he has to flex his wrist or not. Now, he sort of has this funky motion. I thought I was going to be able to show you a bit of a hornblower sign, but he has a bit of an awkward ability to put his hand up to his head, and he's trying to describe that there is a plane of motion that he finds much easier and planes of motion that he really can't move through very efficiently. So I think that, again, that tells you about uh, a poor external rotation moment arm that he has. <coughs> hornblower sign, I think we all recognize. It really tells us that the cuff tear has progressed posteriorly and that you have uh, significant uh, infraspinatus involvement, maybe into teres minor, and that there's very poor posterior force couples and is a bad prognostic sign. I think would correlate with high degrees of gutalia changes in the muscle and I think poor prognosis with respect to repair. <coughs> liftoff test, uh, liftoff test in our study showed a likelihood ratio of five, which is very, very high, which means if you have a positive liftoff test, you have a subscapularis tear. The problem is you may have subtle degrees of subscapularis uh, pathology that's not picked up with a uh, liftoff test. Why would that be? Well, it hurts to put your hand in internal rotation, so a lot of patients with stiffness and pain don't like their hand behind their back and lift off. So for that reason, I often test more on the belly press test to put them in a more comfortable range of motion. Bear hug test, I don't use so much, but again, you're just putting the arm in maximum internal rotation, taking the pec out of play, and, and isolating the subscapularis. So again, the strength assessment, empty can, full can, are validated and useful. Extra rotation, both adduction and abduction, belly press, lift off, bear hug test, all should be uh, included in your cuff assessment. How about impingement tests? I come from the land of impingement because Rich Hawkins uh, was from London, Ontario, trained with, with Charlie Neer as his first fellow. So we heard a lot about impingement tests and uh, I found this great picture of Jack Kennedy doing an impingement test on Pete Fowler, my mentor, and Pete was a swimmer and they published a, a paper on the swimmer's shoulder and, and impingement. The problem with these tests, and I have to confess I don't use them very often, is they're not specific and they're not sensitive. So almost anything in the shoulder that hurts is going to have a positive impingement test, and it doesn't really help us sort out that well uh, what the cause of that pain is. What about the biceps? I think we, we spent a lot of attention talking about the biceps. Sorting it out in the office is sometimes a real challenge. So we know that the pathology can be intra-articular, extra-articular, part of the cuff uh, disease spectrum. We can have instability, tina sign of eyes. So there's a lot of different um, pathologies associated with the long head of biceps. This is a publication from uh, Steve O'Brien that I think is quite interesting. Steve has spent his whole career looking at the biceps, trying to study the biceps, quantify it. And he's published, I think, a, a, a quite a useful paper on physical examination correlation with pathology. So his uh, new test, the three-pack that he talks about uh, on the top are the active compression test, which is his slap test, um, which he is uh, for interarticular pathology of the biceps. And then in the C, the one that's marked C is the throwing test where you're resisting a throwing motion is for biceps instability. So may or may not have subscapularis pathology with it. And then the D is, uh, is just palpation of a tender bicep. So he calls that the three pack. Really looking at the different parts of the biceps and see if you can sort that out. And you can see in his study, they, were, they looked at uh, symptomatic patients versus asymptomatic patients and how predictive that test was. So for a 
uh, active compression or O'Brien's test, 80% of patients who were symptomatic had a positive test, 18% who are asymptomatic had a positive test. And if you've seen Steve do his test ever, I think we'd all be symptomatic if he did it on us. Um, the throwing test, again, 33% of symptomatic patients, none that were asymptomatic had a positive test. And with the tenderness, 11% of asymptomatic patients also had a tender biceps. But I do think those are useful, useful tests. I no longer do speeds and Jurgensen's because I don't know what to do with them. So those are no longer part of my biceps assessment. So these are now uh, tests, uh, you know, physical examination, no different than a blood test or an MRI or anything else. They can be studied scientifically, look at your sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value and whatnot. And uh, we published on this with one of our PhD students uh, a couple of years ago. 130 patients, so we looked at a multitude of physical examination in patients who presented with a cuff picture. The gold standard was surgery or an arthrogram MRI to really tell us I guess what the true pathology was. Now, if we look at some of these tests, so for example, the lateral rotation leg sign, 19% specific. So it means if you don't have it, you could still have a cuff tear. But if you do have it, 97% chance you're gonna have a cuff tear. So it's very important. And so it tells us about big cuff tears, obviously. How about uh, uh, subscapularis? If we look at the liftoff test, 25% uh, sensitive, but highly specific. So. Uh, the belly press test is 50%. So I think it just tells us that maybe it's a little more comfortable and easier to do a belly press test. And those subtle degrees of subscapularis pathology may be not picked up on this. So some of the ones that maybe George showed us, maybe they could still generate enough force to, to fake you in the belly press or lift off test, but they're highly specific. So if you have a test positive, you've got a subscapularis tear. So very important test to do. What about stability tests? I don't routinely do stability tests unless the history would tell me I should, but I do in, a, in the painful young shoulder, particularly the overhead athlete, when we're looking for cuff pathology like internal impingement, undersurface cuff tears. So we're not looking for instability. What we're looking for is reduction in pain with the relocation maneuver, which you're disengaging the impinging, internal impinging lesion. So that would be, the, I think, the exception. When would I do this kind of test? So when I'm looking for that posterior superior labral pathology, undersurface cuff lesion, as decreasing pain as opposed to stabilizing the shoulder. So in summary, there's a lot of things we can do. Examination of the disease cuff uh, is a bit of an art form, but we are starting to put some science behind each one of these tests, and I think you need to pay attention to those. Red flags, I think uh, this case that uh, Mike just presented has a lot of those red flags. Visible wasting, poor active range, lag sign, horn blower signs are all signs that you're gonna have a difficult time with a repair, uh, unless you do something different, you're gonna have a difficult time keeping it together. Tests for the subscap are quite specific and moderately sensitive. So thanks very much for the invitation and uh, really enjoying the meeting.